This week's parsha is Vayeshev. Vayeshev means, and he settled. And Jacob settles down in the land of his father, in the land of Canaan. So if you look at Jacob's life over the past 40 years, it's really been very chaotic. Uh, he is, uh, upon the urging of his mother, he has to usurp the blessing. Esau wants to murder him. He has to escape Esau. He meets Laban, and he has to work for seven years. He gets tricked, gets married, the, marries the wrong woman, has to work for another seven years. Uh, then another six years he's there, and he's working for salary, and his salary uh, changes a hundred times. I did the math. That's 16 times a year. More than once a month, his salary is changing because his father was not happy uh, with uh, with the deal. He's always trying to negotiate for a better deal. Finally, he escapes in the middle of the night. Uh, he Laban chases him down. He has a standoff with him. He is successful in, in navigating away from that. His next great... Uh, a challenge is going to be when he meets Esau. He meets Esau, and he's all worried, and he has to send the gift, and he has to pray and prepare for war and split the camp into two. And even he gets through that peacefully. And finally, Jacob is ready to settle down. And the commentary, Rashi tells us here that this was a little bit of a mistake that, on Jacob's part. Our life here is not one of complacency. Not, we, we shouldn't settle down. We're here to work. We're here to improve. We're here to become greater and greater. And even though we may have had challenges in the past, it doesn't mean that we could, okay, say that, okay, now we're we're on autopilot. Now we're just going to kind of let life go. Because once you stop growing, you start regressing. And the way the Midrash puts it is that Jacob wanted to sit peacefully and to settle down and now to finally live out his life. And the first thing that happens is the next great challenge of his life, and that's Joseph. So it starts off telling us about the sons of, of Jacob, and it really stops and talks about Joseph, who was a 17-year-old. He was a shepherd with his brothers, with the flock. And he was friendly with the sons of Bila and the sons of Zilpah, the wives of his father. So there's a little bit of a dynamic here. Jacob has two main wives, uh, Leah and Rachel. He has uh, eight sons and one daughter from those two. And then there's the four other children that are from the kind of secondary wives, Bill and Zilpa, uh, that are the other four sons that comprise the 12 sons of Jacob. And there was a little bit of a conflict, you would imagine, between the, these two groups, because some of the brothers feel like they're more superior than the others. But Joseph was very friendly with the sons of Bill and sons of Zilpa. And then critically, end of chapter, end of verse 2, and Joseph brought their evil reports back to their father. And this is really where it gets interesting because Joseph was a little bit of a, he was bad-mouthing his brothers for their misdeeds. If they mistreated the other brothers and said that they're, uh, you know, a little bit less important because their mother happened to have been one of the handmaidens, he would would tattletale to his father. Uh, But Israel, his father, loved Joseph from all his kids, because he was a child of his old age, and he made him this special sweater. Now, there's a huge debate amongst the commentaries about Jacob's pedagogical uh, uh, preference to, to Joseph. We know one of the ironclad rules of, rules of parenting is that you shouldn't show favoritism to one child over the other, because that is going to create animosity amongst the children. Now, apparently from this verse, it seems like Jacob had a favorite son, and that was Joseph. He loved Joseph more than his other sons, and he made him a special coat to kind of symbolize that, and that really caused a lot of jealousy for the other children. Uh, Now, we're very hesitant to try to uh, cast aspersions on the behavior of the great uh, leaders of the people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, unless it's substantiated in the verses and and in the literature. So there's a whole debate over here, did Jacob show favoritism or not? It seems from a simple reading that he did. Uh, Now, I want to point out that clearly, even if if Jacob made a mistake in showing favoritism, he was punished for it very severely. Uh, The fact that he... Uh, his son was kidnapped from him. He, as we'll see, spoiler alert, um, but <laughs> his son was kidnapped and he had to spend the next 22 years kind of in flux and limbo. Is he alive? Is he not alive? What's going to be with him? 
Uh, number one. Number two, we'll see later on from the story that if he did have favoritism initially, that was stamped out and he did not have fa- favoritism uh, in the end. Uh, additionally, he also taught him Torah, Rashi tells us, ben zikunim hulo, which means that he would invest his relationship that he had with Joseph to teach him all that he uh all that he knew. And I think this this is a good lesson for us. Of course, we don't want to show favoritism, but we have to find in our children the unique capacity that they have. And thus, if you see one child that's more uniquely qualified, for example, for Torah study, then you should you should invest in that with your relationship. We know that we're not trying to change our children. We're trying to maximize their abilities and potential. Joseph had a certain knack, a certain uh, capacity for being the receptacle of Jacob's Torah and Jacob's lessons and uh, of his many multitudes of children and grandchildren, he selected Joseph to be his continuation with regards to his knowledge. The brothers saw that J- that Joseph was more beloved to their father. They hated him. They couldn't possibly speak to him peacefully. And all this, there was fuel added to the tension when Joseph has these two dreams. So the first dream that Joseph has, and it seems like like he naively tells him to his brothers, is uh, seems a little bit megalomaniacal, because he tells his own brothers that we were all in the fields gathering our bundles, and my bundle stood erect, and all your bundles bowed down to mine. They were not happy with that. And he's like, and they, they tell them, you know, Joseph, you're going to rule over us. That's what you're implying, right? Is that your bundle is going to stand up straight like a king, and we're all, going to all bow down before you. That's not going to happen. And that just increased their hatred for him. And then he had another dream, and again, he told it to his brothers, this time also to his father as well. And that was that the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to him which is implying not just that his brothers, the 11 brothers, were bowed down to him, but also the sun, i.e. his father, and the moon, his mother. And his father gets very disappointed with that. He starts screaming at him and scolding him. And he says, is this a real dream? Your mother, after all, we just read in last week's parsha, is dead. So is your mother going to come bow down to you? Obviously, the dream is nonsensical. And therefore, he's trying to discourage him from believing its veracity. But the truth is that while his, his brothers were envious of him, his father secretly anticipated that it would happen. He publicly scolded him, but privately believed that there was some truth to these dreams. Now, this is not the first time we've seen dreams in Genesis. We saw, of course, dreams with Jacob with the ladder, and Jacob had multiple dreams already. And... What's important to know is that every dream that we meet in the Torah is actually a prophecy. Now, we have dreams. The Talmud tells us that our dreams are a 60th of prophecy. There's like a little smidge, a little drop of prophecy in our dreams. But certainly, the greater someone is, the more connected to truth someone is, the more connected to truth their dreams are as well. And... If someone is entirely connected to truth, then there's no room for any untruth to filter in, and therefore even their dreams have truth to them. So Joseph is having these dreams, and there's this question, is it going to happen? Is it foretelling some future event? And we know that, indeed, everything that he's describing did exactly happen. Now, his mother's dead, but remember what happened when his mother died. Who took over? Billah. Remember, Jacob moved his primary residence because Billah was Rachel's handmaiden. Thus, Billah is still alive, and thus she, quote-unquote, fit, you know, fits the cater- uh, categorization of her mother. But even in modern times, we see that there, is, there are some dreams that we can have that are indeed proven out, born out to be true. I know myself, I've experienced uh, life situations where I've been there before. I know I've been there before. It's just because I was there in a dream and I don't necessarily connect to that. It's a little fuzzy and something there's, there's always elements of the dream that are not true. A dream can never be ex- entirely true unless it's real prophecy. And therefore, 
there's always going to be, it's always going to be muddled. It's hard to pull out the real message, but this still exists. And I have a few stories I want to share here. In, in, um, in the early part of the 20th century, in a place called Lamja, there was a huge disagreement and uh, in the yeshiva. And there was a, a, there was a fight, a real fight in the yeshiva. And in the middle of the fight... You mean a physical fight? I don't know. It, it was physical. I, I don't know what it was exactly. It's not... It's not it's, it seemed like it might have even been physical, which is unthinkable, of course. But in the middle of this huge battle that was brewing, the Chafetz Chaim, who lived at uh, the other end of, of, of Europe, he showed up and he clarified what was going on. So they, they asked him, how did he know? How did he know... To come, like it's not like someone sent him a tweet or something like that to show up. How did he know to come? So he said that he had a dream that there was a fire in Lamja in that city, and he knew obviously that there was some sort of message to him. And he's like, there's some sort of real problem, and he went there to to, to, to clarify it. In fact, we even have a there's a there's a book a book of Torah teachings from a famous poorly uh, described as a Kabbalist, one of the great Torah scholars. Uh, Rabbi Tzadok, the name Rabbi Tzadok, he wrote a, a book called Divrei Chalomos, The Words of Dreams, which were all his novel Torah insights that he had while he dreamt. And there is a way to do this. If someone's just thinking about a question, a, a Torah question, as they're falling asleep, it's very likely that they'll actually dream about that and they may indeed find an answer to their question. And I have a st- another story, a remarkable story, that happened to someone who's still alive and it's documented and verified and it's true. There was, a, there was a, an individual who never missed his Dafyomi Shir. Dafyomi is a worldwide institution of Daf, which means a page of Talmud every day. People study a page of Talmud every day. There's hundreds of thousands of people following a set seven-and-a-half-year schedule, going through all of Talmud, studying Daf Yomi, Daf every day. Yom is a day, right? Every day they start study one, one page. And this individual never missed a day. He was never, he was never late. No matter what happened, he never missed a day. <clears throat> and for whatever reason, one day he missed it, and he tried to make it up for it by himself at home. So he's by, by himself. He's studying. And... He's trying to get through the page, and he arrived to a problematic passage. He didn't understand. He tried to understand. They tried to think. He had questions, and he's sitting there late at night in his dining room, trying to understand the Rashi, and he's thinking about it, and he just fell asleep. And he has a dream, and he sees someone who looks like an angel coming to him and telling him, you have this problem in the Talmud. Let's sit together and study it. So they sit down together and they learn in his dreams, all his dream, for a long time. And uh, finally, makes it all clear. Everything makes sense. When when that individual, that angel-like uh, figure leaves, he's, you know, the dreamer has asked him, "What's your name?" He said, "Well, my name's Rashba." Okay, remembers that story. Fine. Wakes up the next morning, and he goes back to his daily routine. And he goes back to his Dafyomi class that he goes to every day. And he after the class, he tells the, the, the lecturer who leads the class the story, what happened to him. He gets very excited. He walks over to the shelf, puts, pulls out the book, Chidushe HaRashba. The Rashba was one of the great Rishonim. The uh, uh, Rabbi Shlomo Ben Aderet. He was one of the great medieval uh, commentators in the Talmud. And he opens up the, that particular page, corresponding page of the Talmud, and he says that exactly what he was found out in the dream is exactly what the Rashba actually says in his commentary. And it was just a remarkable, uh, unbelievable example of someone who's studying Torah and is able to evoke such an experience. Um, on a little bit of a similar, I guess a similar case of uh, uh, a fortunate dreaming, not quite as remarkable, but there was a, a group of Torah scholars, nine Torah scholars that were flying in an airplane in the United States together. I don't know exactly where the story was, not clear where, where they were flying to precisely. But when they arrived, there was a snowstorm in the local airport, so they had to land in a different airport. And they ended up landing 
in a U.S. Army base airport, a military airport or airfield. And they get there, so there's nine scholars that need one more for a minion. But where are you going to find a minion? How are you going to find a minion, a quorum of ten men, to pray together? So as they're sitting around, milling around, trying to figure out what to do, uh, a, an officer in the army just comes to them and is like, you guys are looking for a minion, right? Come, I'm, I'll be your tenth. And they pray and find it. Dumincha, fine. And he tells them what happened. This officer tells them that he's an observant Jew. And even though he's living on this you know, far flung Air Force base or whatever, middle of nowhere, he tries to observe as much as he can of Torah mitzvahs. And he was disappointed because the yard site of his father was upcoming. And he was worried he didn't have a minion to, uh, to pray with. So, and then he has this dream. And in his dream, last night, the previous night, his father, his deceased father, comes to him. And he tells him, you should pray to the Almighty and you'll see that a minion will just appear for you. So he says, the whole morning... I was praying to my father in heaven, send me a minion. And then I see you guys are landing and I see nine Torah scholars showing up and I know I have my minion. <laughs> but I, I, th- I think the general lesson here is that like this idea, it's not so easy to quantify, to understand like what are the parameters of it, but it's still true. We still have this capacity uh, of... Uh, of, of, of conjuring, not conjuring, but of, of experiencing this kind of, uh, of dream that has a degree of truth to it as well. Now, his father is able to, um, have a dualistic respond to this dream. On one hand, he recognizes that the brothers are getting envious, so he wants to kind of quiet the, uh, expectations of Joseph, he starts streaming him, oh, is this true? Obviously it can't be true. But secretly, he believes and he's anticipating that it indeed can come true. <clears throat> now the words that the verse uses in verse 11, Va'aviv shamar et hadavar, and his father guarded it. Now, the word shamar means to guard, but we also use it in matters of Torah. For example, we pray every morning, Right? to guard. And you look at Deuteronomy, and I think 50 times in Deuteronomy it says we should guard the Torah. And I think that, you know, here it's using that word to describe anticipation of a future event. I think it's a good lesson for us to say that when we study about Torah and we're told to guard it, what it also means is that we should anticipate fulfilling it. So my grandfather used to always say, that you have a guy who's studying Torah, and he's learning about what happens, the wonderful levels of someone who is lends money to a poor person in their time of great need. It's one of the greatest things you can do, to lend money to a poor person in a time of great need. He's studying it by his table, really learning it, and he gets a knock on the door, and a poor person comes and asks for a loan. And he's like, well, come to me at the office, I don't have time right now, I'm busy, I have to ask my wife. All the excuses in the world suddenly pop up in their head. Because when they were studying the Torah, they weren't studying it with the anticipation, when can I finally fulfill it? It was totally just something theoretical, something intellectual, and that's not doing your job. Your job when you study Torah is to, be, to, to guard it, to find, uh, or to at least to yearn and hope and anticipate for an opportunity to fulfill it. Joseph's brothers go out to to tend to the flock and the pasture. And Jacob instructs Joseph that your brothers are out in the pasture. Go go check up on them. Go find out how they're doing. Joseph goes, travels to meet them. They see him from afar and they kind of have him isolated and their enmity towards him gets aroused and they plan and scheme to kill Joseph. And they said one to another, look, that dreamer is coming. So now come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits and we will say a wild beast devoured him and then we'll see what happens with his dreams. So Reuven here, is this Reuven, the oldest brother, he's amongst the ten brothers out there because with the exception of Joseph and Benjamin, Benjamin's not there. So Reuven, here's what, what they're plotting. Remember, these are the same people that mowed down a whole city of Shechem. These are dangerous, well, not dangerous, but uh, they... Uh, are no strangers 
to, uh, to, to violence when they believe it is justified. And we'll have to see why they believe it's justified. But Reuven hears this. He stops him. We're not going to kill him. Let's not shed no blood. Instead, let's just throw him in the pit alive. But don't touch him. And the Torah testifies that Reuben's intention was to rescue him and bring him back to his father. And so it was. Joseph arrives to check up on them. They strip him off his fancy sweater and they throw him into the pit. And the pit was empty. There's no water in it. And Rashi, a famous Rashi, tells us there's no water, but there were snakes and scorpions in, in there. And then they sit down to eat and they see a caravan of Ishmaelites carrying spices. And Judah now says, well, what are we going to do? We're going to kill our brother? Let's just sell him as a slave and let's not kill him. So they agreed and they sell him. They sell him to the Ishmaelites and the Midianites and the travelers. And eventually Joseph ends up in Egypt. Reuven returns. Joseph's out of the pit and he rips his garments. So the brothers want to kill Joseph. Reuven stops them and says, throw him in the pit. Judah stops them and says, sell him as a slave. They sell him as a slave. What do they tell Jacob? So they take his tunic and they slaughter an animal that has a very similar color blood to that of a human. They dunk the tunic in the blood and they come to Jacob and they say, this is, this is what we found. We just found this sweater. Do you recognize it? Is this, is this Joseph's sweater? And he recognized it and said, oh, this is, this is my son's tunic. A savage beast devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to bits. Jacob rips his, his garments in mourning. And he's, and, he, and he's just mourning for his son. And he's unconsolable. And eventually, Joseph is sold from one person to the other person. He ends up with Potiphar, who's um, one of Pharaoh's ministers in charge of the butchers. Um, brothers first try to kill Joseph. Now, obviously, they had to have had some rationale for doing that. They, they, don't weren't just, they weren't murderers. They believed that there was some justification. Just like in the episode of Dina that we read last week with the city of Shechem, they believed that they had some basis for their actions. What was their basis? So, so, so everyone tries to figure out what is going on here. Why, is, why, why are the brothers uh, considering, contemplating, and even attempting to, to, to kill Joseph? So one of the reasons given, one of the main reasons given, there's other reasons as well, is that they, the brothers, everyone knew that Jacob, whatever he said was true. So, for example, when he said that whoever stole uh, Laban's idol is going to die, that person actually died, even though he didn't even intend that it, it comes true, but that's what happened with Jacob. Joseph is funneling bad, uh, bad information about the brothers to Jacob, so it's very possible that Jacob may say something negative about the brothers, and they'll die. So it's almost as if Jake, Joseph is a rodif, is a pursuer. He's trying to kill the brothers through his actions because he's going to tell Jacob something bad about the brothers and the brothers will die and therefore someone comes to kill you, you got to kill them first. That was their rationale. But they weren't necessarily certain. So what do they do? So what, so, so what does Reuven tell them? Reuven says he wants to save them. So what does he say? Don't kill him, throw him into the pit full of snakes. <laughs> Is that really how you try to save someone? Someone's in, in, in a perilous situation. That may, that, that someone wants to kill them. Let's save them. Throw them into the pit full of snakes. So what, what Reuben is essentially telling them, and I, I think there's two things here. First of all, if there's a murderous mob um, that are convinced that what they're doing is justified, to try to tell them to not do it entirely is not likely to succeed. But if you change it a little bit in a way that maybe later on you can... Uh, rescue the person that maybe has a fighting chance. But there's also a big argument that, J- that Reuben is making. This is a little bit of a, of a um, philosophical uh, idea. We know that God is in control of everything, right? But we also have free will. So we're in control of some things as well, right? So there's this, there's this, you know, what determines what happens to me? Well, God, of course, but also my free will, I choose my path but also the free will of others. Others, you know, they, they also can affect me. So if someone is a victim, God forbid, of a homicide, does that mean that God wanted them dead? 
Not necessarily, right? It means that wh- whoever shot them, whoever committed a heinous crime, that person has free will, and that free will also means that th- their free will can affect others. So, and minus, if, if someone is a homicide victim, are they necessarily guilty of a capital crime? No, right? They're not, they're a victim. Is it, it's possible God wants them dead? Yes, but there's also the aggressor, and the aggressor took matters into their own hand and went to kill someone. So we don't know if the dead person is actually guilty or not. So Ruvain's telling them is like this. You guys are convinced that Joseph deserves to be executed. You have your reasons. You have your rationale why he deserves to be executed. But what if you're wrong? What if you're not justified? Well, if you go ahead and murder your brother, we'll never know if he's guilty because you're imposing your free will upon him. Maybe he's really innocent and you're killing him. But if you throw him into the pit and leave him for God to deal with and he dies, well, then you say God killed him because he really was guilty. But if you... If you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you, you're, with your own hands, you try to kill him, well, that means that we'll never know if he's guilty or not. So instead, leave it up, leave it up, up to God. Now, Ruvain was convinced that he was not guilty and was going to save him, but he had planned to come back to the pit and take him out. We see that he leaves in the interim, and when he comes back, he doesn't, he finds out only later that the brothers had sold him. Now, why did he leave? And Rashi quotes two reasons. Reason number one is that he went to tend to his father. There was always one brother with the father. Another alternative reason is that Ruvain was repenting for his sin of last week's Parsha. Remember last week's Parsha, uh, Ruvain is rearranging the beds of his father, and uh, that is, uh, the Torah treats it very severely, and therefore Ruvain went on, on, on a mission of isolation to try and repent for his misdeeds. Either way, Ruvain's not there when they actually sell him, but he had intended, he had intended to, uh, to save him afterward. Now, what's really interesting here is that both Ruvain and Judah try to save Joseph. None of them do a full job. Ruvain says, I'll stop them from killing him now, and later on I'll save him. Judah says, I'll save him from death, but I'll just sell him off as a slave. So both of them try to save him, but none of them does a complete job. Whereas the rest of the brothers, none of them try to save him at all. But what's really interesting is that both Reuven and Judah are both criticized for saving him because they at least started something and didn't quite finish it. And sometimes it's worse to start a project and not finish it than to not start a project at all. It's almost as if if you build a table, but you only put four, uh, th- I'm sorry, you only put three legs on it, and it's now, it's now wobbly, well, maybe it's better to not build a table at all than to build a table that's not functional. It's really interesting to look at the criticism that we find about Ruvain and, and Judah. So the Talmud tells us that Ruvain, this is an interesting quote of the Talmud, had Ruvain know, known that for eternity the Torah would record this particular event, remember, they didn't know that the Torah was going to record their life events necessarily, or partic- which events that are going to be forever enshrined in the Torah. But had Ruvain known that the Almighty is going to write this episode, that Ruvain tried to save him and said, throw him in the pit, what he would have actually done is taken Joseph, put him on his shoulders, and bring him back to his father. Which means that Reuven's going to have to live with the eternal shame of starting to save uh, Joseph, but not actually finishing it. And the reason why he made that mistake is because he didn't realize the eternality of his behavior. He didn't realize that this, this is going to be forever. In 2016 in Houston, where he's discussing his, this, his mistake. He didn't realize that. And over the, over the years, it's been discussed millions of times. And, and had he known that this action would continue forever, he would have, he would have just said, oh, throw him into the pit. Put him on my shoulders. If you want to touch him, you got to touch me first, right? You can't, he's untouchable. And he would have saved him. There's an interesting lesson for us. We don't think of our actions as, as having so many 
co consequences of permutations. So we kind of start projects and, you know, we don't necessarily think about how important it is that we do a complete job with our, with our behavior. You know, I would say perhaps how many Josephs do we have in our lives that we said, oh, we'll do it. We get, we get started in a project and it's a project that can change the world. And who knows that, you know, in our book, so to speak, that chronicles our life, that's going to be our legacy forever. It also is going to say that, oh, we started this and had we known the importance of our behavior, we would have put it on our shoulders and just get it done with. Um, Ruvain made a mistake, even though he's, he actually saved Joseph. Uh, but he, had he actually known the impact of his behavior, he would have just done the, done the complete thing. And Judah also, we'll see in a little bit, Judah did not, he also intended to save uh, Ruvain. I'm sorry, he also intended to save Joseph. And he too was punished for not doing a complete job. Now, the brothers sell Joseph to a caravan in verse 25. A caravan of Ishmaelites come from Gilad, their camels bearing spices, balsam, and lotus. Now, the Torah is not necessarily telling us the cargo of, uh, of the caravan that's going to carry Joseph for no reason. Who needs to know? Why is this so significant that we are told what the cargo of, uh, of the Ishmaelites that were carrying Joseph down to Egypt, what it was? Why is that significant? And... Rashi tells us that the reason why we're told this to tell us the reward of tzaddikim, because usually these kinds of caravans would be carrying like kerosene, a very bad, foul-smelling cargo. But because Joseph was coming down with them, he should have a really nice smell of balsam and spices. That's what Rashi says. Now, you can imagine your brothers are kidnapped, kidnapped you, they, you know, they tried to kill you. They threw you, threw you in a pit full of snakes. They said, oh, we'll sell you as a slave. You're going down to Egypt. Your life is basically over, right? But you're, you're not going to be treated like a Jewish slave given a nice bed and blanket. Who knows what's going to be with your future? You're 17 years old, and this is what your life amounts to. You're in a caravan heading down to Egypt with foreign captors. Are you really thinking about the smell of the cargo that's the, that they're carrying with you? You're really not. If, if Joseph wanted to be rewarded, wouldn't it make sense for it to be rewarded to not be sent to, to Egypt to begin with? Okay. But this is a good lesson, I think, for us. When bad things happen, we have to recognize that the Almighty allowed it to happen, and it's part of our lot. And Joseph had to go down to Egypt for whatever reason. Like It was part of God's big plan here. But... The fact that he had to have a foul-smelling journey, that did not have to happen. And thus, he only got exactly what he needed to get, and not one iota, one smidgen more. And I think for us, sometimes when bad things happen, we just think that kind of God just lumps it all in together. Like, it just you know, there's just an incessant blows from God. But the truth is, we get everything's precisely measured. If if Joseph did not need to have a little bit of more pain in his journey, he wouldn't have gotten that. So Joseph is sold down uh, to Egypt to Potiphar, and then the next chapter is an, we go off on an entirely different tangent to tell the story of Judah and eventually Judah and Tamar. And I think this is a very good uh, example of the Torah not being strictly chronological. Because Joseph is sold down to Egypt, and then we go uh, off to this tangent to talk about Judah and his wife and his kids and the kid's wife. It's obviously a multi-decade story. And then we go back to, to jo Joseph, right back to Joseph, who has been sold to Egypt. So nothing really changed in Joseph's timeline. But we went off to the side, to the tangent, to tell us uh, a whole story about, about Judah. Judah descended from his brothers, and he gets married. And this dissension is a demotion. And Rashi tells us that the juxtaposition of these two sections is to tell us that the reason why Judah went off on his own and was demoted, so to speak, because he was the leader. He was a natural leader. And eventually we'll see that he becomes the family of royalty, of, of the monarchy of the Jewish people, is from Judah. And 
The brothers told him when they saw how devastated their father was and inconsolable he was, they said to Judah, well, you sh- it's your fault because you should have told us not to do it and bring him back. We would have listened to you. And therefore his status amongst his brothers was diminished. And he went off and he got married. He married this woman. And they have three kids in, in succession, Er, Onan, and Shela. And Er, his, um, the oldest son of Judah, marries a woman by the name of Tamar. And Er was bad in the eyes of God, and God killed him. And what happened to his widow, to Tamar, was that she married the next brother. And this is an example of what eventually the Torah is going to be, Leverite marriage. One brother dies childless, the next brother actually marries the widow, his sister-in-law. And the children that they have are going to be a legacy to the dead brother. Now, unfortunately, Onan as well dies because he refuses to establish offspring for his brother, and he was also bad, and he also died. Now, why did they die? What was so evil about them? So the verse, first of all, links them together. And and verse uh, 9 tells us that he um, he would not try to impregnate his wife, and he would let his seed go uh, to waste on the ground. And that was evil, and he did it, and his brother did that as well, and therefore he died as well. So this, uh, Rashi tells us, Rashi quotes the Talmud, the Talmud tells us that she was a really beautiful woman, and they were worried that if she got a little rotund in gestation, she wouldn't be as beautiful. Uh, and this is the source, uh, the uh, prohibition against uh, spilling seed is sourced over here. And in fact, the Talmud tells us that uh, someone who refuses to procreate is akin to a murderer. In this instance, uh, the uh, the criticism is much more than just spilling seed, but it's, it's spilling seed exclusively with intention of refraining from procreation. It's interesting here. So what happens? So he dies as well. So she's leaving a whole litany of dead husbands in her wake, and she says, okay, well, there's another boy as well. Put him next in line. And she was like, no, we tried this twice. Let's, uh, he's too young. And he clearly has no intention. And he's, and the verse tells us that he thought, lest he die like his brothers. This woman is, she's not, she's no good. Judah thought that you know, she was problematic. She's killing all his kids. She, he doesn't want to give his, her, his third and last final son to, her. Okay, so many years passed. Judah's own wife died, and uh, Judah's really left with almost nothing. He has a, a, a dead wife, and he has uh, two dead sons, and he has one son who's a young son as well. And it's interesting, the Talmud tells us, this gets back to what happened earlier, that whoever starts a mitzvah and doesn't finish it will bury his wife and his sons. Why? Judah started to save (coughs) Joseph, but he didn't quite finish the job, and he allowed him to just be sent away. And therefore, because he didn't finish the mitzvah, in exact measure for measure for what he did, he received. So he also started a mitzvah to build a family, to build a Jewish family, to have a wife, to have kids, to have a legacy. He started the mitzvah, but because he didn't finish the first mitzvah, he doesn't get to finish this mitzvah, and he had to bury his wife and his sons. Now, Tamar, she goes back to her father's home, and it's been a long time, and she finds out that Shayla has grown up, and no one sent her a postcard, oh, you know, now come back, and she is determined to become part of, um, of the Jewish family. She's one of the great heroines in the Torah. So what she devises her plan and somewhat surprising. She finds out that her father-in-law is coming to town. She takes off her widow's garb, and she sits at the crossroads of the of the town because she sees that Shayla has grown up and the whole thing, uh, we'll call you back when he's ready, that was just a hoax. Judah sees, so she's basically impersonating a prostitute. Judah sees her, 
He thought she was a harlot since she had covered her face. And he detoured off the road. He prepositioned to her. He didn't know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she says, well, okay, well, what are you going to pay me for? He says, well, I'll give you, a, I'll give you some, some of my flock. And she says, well, where's your, I don't see any flock with you. Give me some sort of guarantee that, uh, that you will uh, pay up. So he says, okay, what do you want? She says, I want your signet ring. I want your wrap and your staff. Basically everything that's your identification uh, that is from you. He gave it to her. Uh, they consorted and she conceived. She left. She took off the veil. She put back on her regular clothing. And Judah now wants to pay up. So he sends his people to pay up to her. They don't find her. No one's ever heard of this lady. And she was like, okay, well, just let her keep whatever she has. And that's the end of the story. Or so he thought. Three months later, he finds out that his daughter-in-law uh, has been a little bit uh, mischievous and she is she committed harlotry and she's conceived. So Judah says, well, well, what happens to such women? They get burned. So she's being taken out to, to be burned and she sends a message to her father-in-law with the signorine and the staff and she says to him, well, the, the person who owns this, that, that's the father. Do you recognize who it is? <laughs> And it's interesting that the exact same words that were used to deceive the father in the previous chapter. Do you recognize this tunic? Whose tunic is this? Do you recognize it? How can Do you know perhaps whose this is? That's exactly the same words that she ends up telling Judah decades later. Do you re- perhaps recognize this signet ring and this staff? And Judah, Judah recognized. And he had... Uh, he had the guts to admit that she was right. So he says, she is right. It is for me. And it's my fault that I didn't give her Shayla. And uh, and she just got what she deserved, which is someone from the family to come and marry her. She gave birth to twins. And indeed, these are going to be the forebearers of the Messiah. So there's a few interesting uh, elements of the story. Well, first of all, the Midrash tells us that Judah really did not have free will to uh, refuse the services of Tamar. In fact, the Midrash tells us that there's an angel who is uh, assigned on lust. He's the lust angel. And he came to Judah and he just pulled the lever to such a degree to make it that he his free will was temporarily suspended, and that's why he behaved as such. And this is an example, because there are national interests at hand, that Judah and Tamar have to come together, therefore we cannot allow Judah himself to calculate that, or to, to weigh the options, and therefore he this has to happen, and his free will is suspended. And um, But this is also another great example, or at least maybe, I think it's maybe the first great example of uh, of the story of redemption. Redemption, we always think we could telegraph how redemption is going to happen. So one example is uh, the family of Messiah. We know the family, if you look at the, at, at the marriages that are the forebears of David, you have this story, scandal. You have the story of Boaz and Ruth, also a scandal. She snuggles up to the middle of the night. Some stranger. What's going on over there? Right? He's a widow. Well, what is going on over there? Right? This doesn't seem to be uh, the, the, the shining moment for the Jewish people. And then you have a story of David and Bathsheba. Oh gosh! Right? Is there a, is there a scandal there? And all those relationships are going to bring about the Messiah and King David and the, the line of King David, the line of royalty. And there's a few reasons for that. First of all, to be a great Jewish leader, it means that you have to have some sort of skeletons in your closet. If you if you don't have, if you're able to lord of other people and you are you just have a spotless record, you're not a good leader because you can't identify with the average Joe. In order to be a great leader, someone could have empathy and not have the arrogance to say, I'm perfect and my record is... Is, is flawless, that's not a qualification 
for a great leader. David, right? Well, what were they saying about David? You know what they were saying about David? But they were questioning whether he's legitimate. Because he wants to deal with his mother, his great, his great grandmother, his grandmother was Ruth. She was a Moabite. The Torah says Moabites can join the people. The truth is it's Moabite men, not Mo- Mo- Moabite women, but you know, that's a, uh, you know, that's a, not easy for people to parse out. They were saying to him, well, they used to call him derisively. They would say to, uh, the Talmud records is that Whenever Joseph would meet up with, with his detractors, they would say to him, uh, uh, not Joseph, whenever David would meet with his detractors, uh, they would say to him, David, we have a halacha question. Okay, well, what's your halacha question? Tell us, what's the, uh, what's the Torah law about someone who sleeps with a married woman? And, uh, which is obviously evoking what he, what happened with him in Bathsheba. Scandalous, right? Well, of course, she wasn't married at the time. But, you know, details, right? Uh, so he told, he would tell them, he says, well, someone who sleeps with a married woman, the halacha is that that's an executable offense. It's one of the, uh, it's one of the sins that uh, allows for the execution of the perpetrator. But they still have a portion of the wall to come. But someone who whitens the face of his fellow publicly, Someone who embarrasses someone else publicly, they don't have a portion of the world to come. I.e., you guys are trying to embarrass me, you should know that you're imperiling yourself much more than I am. But still, like, this is really remarkable that the greatest family of the Jewish people is going to show up in such a manner, with such a story. And the real reason why, for it is because we have to go under the radar. If we have bombastic plans of how we're going to change the world and how we're going to bring about our redemption, the forces that are opposing to us will stop it. But a story like this, eh, this will never amount to anything. Right? This is scandalous. This is, And that's how we can fly under the radar and accomplish what it is that we need to do. Uh, Joseph, we'll read about Joseph. Sorry, it's a little bit ahead of our story. Joseph, how is he going to end up uh, as second in command in Egypt? He's going to go to the bottom of the bottom, and in the fortuitous event, he's going to just ascend to the top. But no one would have imagined that all the things that contributed to his downfall and to be at the, at the lowest point on earth, to be in a, in a pit, in a dungeon, in Egypt of all places, that's going to bring, that's going to catapult him to his greatness. So this is another first example of that, the, the, that the story of redemption does not happen in the most expected of manners. Now, Tamar, she is being faced with execution and she could very easily tell everyone, oh, Judah is the one who is the father and I'm justified because he's part of the family that should have remarried me anyhow. Instead, she chose to put the ball in in Judah's court and say, do you recognize, perchance, this signet ring and this staff? Because that's the father. Why did she not just say, uh, Judah's the father, he's the father, I have my evidence. She could have very easily said that. What would have happened had Judah not recognized? I ought to recognize this. No. Just throw it into the fire with him as well. Well, then she would have died, and her two twins would have died as well. And in fact, the Talmud derives a lesson from this. It's preferable, it's better for someone to cast themselves into a fiery furnace than to publicly shame someone else. That's a lesson we learned from Tamar. So she is indeed a great heroine, and we learned Torah lessons from her that she voluntarily chose to give up her life and not embarrass Judah publicly. Thus, if Judah wants to embarrass himself publicly, I'll be saved, my kids will be saved, and I'll have a future. But otherwise, well, I'm not going to do it. And that's a tremendous lesson uh, shows us really the greatness of Tamar and also shows us the greatness of Judah that he was willing to fess up and admit his mistakes when he erred. And when Jacob is going to recount the, the, the life stories about his children, he's going to highlight this particular episode to show us how Judah and Judah's family and Judah's descendants and Judah's power is really uh, uh, tailored for leadership. Because the quality a leader has to have above all else is the capacity to admit when they're wrong. If someone is too prideful to say, I never make any mistakes, then they're likely to make a mistake, not willing to admit it, and get worse uh, worse off because they're just uh, continually ferreting down uh, the wrong hole. Judah is willing to admit his mistake, and that indeed is his greatness 
and the reason why he is primed to be a leader. Okay, back to Joseph. Joseph is sold to Potiphar, uh, and Joseph immediately rises to the top, and this is a theme we see with Joseph again and again. Whatever situation, no matter how bad it is, he puts in his, his, you know, his best foot forward. He becomes uh, the leader of the house of Potiphar. Potiphar entrusts everything in Joseph's hands. And everyone really, everyone's impressed by this young man. He's really beautiful, he's really handsome, he's really competent. Now, unfortunately, Potiphar's wife, she tries to seduce him. And he is continually being prepositioned by her, but he adamantly refuses, and he tells her, look, my master, i.e. your husband, he is in control of nothing in the house, he entrusts me with everything, there's no one greater in this house than I. He has denied me nothing besides for you, because you're his wife. How can I perpetrate this great evil and sin against God? So there's a few interesting things to point out. First of all, if you look at the Hebrew reading of this particular resistance that Joseph has, there is what's called a shalshelas. A shalshelas is one of the, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a very rare symbol um, in, in the Torah. You know, the Torah has these cantillations, how you, ha- how you read them, in the sing song way of reading them. This is one of the few places in the Torah where we see an example of a shalshel, which means it's, it's a way that you repeat, you repeat the sound uh, three times. And the, w- what it's symbolizing is, is that Joseph refused and continually refused again and again. And he just, you know, he just said, no, I'm not doing it. And even, he didn't allow it to fester. Now, what did he tell her? He told her uh, that he cannot sin with her because had he sinned, he, he would be sinning to God. Now, the truth is, it wouldn't just be him sinning to God, it would also be her sinning to God. So why does Joseph tell her, if I did this, I'll be sinning to God? He should have said, if I'll do this, we will be sinning to God. The answer uh, says one of the great Hasidic masters, the Rebbe of Kotsk. Very interesting. He says, had Joseph said, we are sinning to God, he would have had the first step towards sin because he would have included him and her together. We together would have sinned. Even merely mentioning that we together will sin to God, that would unite them and maybe the first step towards them ultimately sinning. Therefore, he tells her, I, if we do it, I will sin to God. And furthermore, every day she's trying to coax him into sin, and he would not agree to lie beside her and to be with her. This is in verse 10. And Rashi tells us, what does it mean to lie beside her and to be with her? What's he refusing? He's refusing two things. He's refusing, number one, to be with her in this world. Number two, to be with her in the next world, in Olam Abba. What this is really telling us here is that the choice that Joseph was faced with was a choice that really had eternal consequences. Had he sinned with the wife of Potiphar, he would have had to live with that forever. And Joseph made it made it a, a clear distinction and told her that I'm not doing this because I don't want to imperil my uh, my eternal future. Sometimes when people sin, it's because they don't necessarily think about the ramifications of their behavior. If they were to think about how uh, you know how uh, that sin will continue to sully the legacy forever. You don't imagine that they would have done it. If you think about, uh, if you think about some of the famous um, people, maybe even presidents, who have behaved unfaithfully uh, to their spouses and to the country, you kind of wonder, like, did they know the consequences of their behavior? Would they have behaved as such had they known the consequences that everyone would know and everyone would laugh at them forever for their infidelity? It's an interesting question. Like, what were they thinking when they did what they did? Sometimes, many times over. It's really, it's really strange. Like, was the pleasure of sin that wonderful that it really, you know, it, it really justified everything they, all the flack they got for decades afterwards because of it? Is it really worthwhile? You really wonder. 
I, I, I would assume they weren't thinking like that. And J- Joseph is showing us a way to resist sin. And the reason why, because the Yetzirah, when he tries to seduce someone to sin, it's very much about the immediate payoff of the, of the sin. And there is an immediate payoff. But what he's not think, what he, what he doesn't want you to think about is the eternal consequences of your sin. And if you try to reorient your thinking, reframe your thinking about the long-term consequences of your behavior, it's likely you'll be able to make a more, a more informed decision about whether you should do that. And you will obviously conclude that it's silly if you were to think about it or as in our example, some of the great political leaders we've had over the past a uh, couple of uh, cent- uh, decades, if they would have considered and weighed the consequences of their behavior, you don't imagine they would have continued and done it. She is adamant upon this. One time she is able to kind of corner him and there's no one else around and she rips off his clothing and tells uh, tells him, okay, let's sin together. He leaves his garment with her and he flees. And she, on a dime, switches her tactic and says, well, actually, he came after me and he took off his clothing and I screamed and he's, he wants to know what's going on with this person. And this is a you know, really shameful behavior on her on her behalf. She's telling him, well, look at this guy. You bring this guy and he's coming here and he's trying to behaving so immorally, and Joseph gets imprisoned. And you think about the status of Joseph in prison, despite being so uh, so true to his morals and his beliefs, and being the one who's just, he is being unjustly imprisoned and besmirched because of the things that he didn't actually do. And the story continues, even though Joseph was in prison, and in really a very low state, he is able to rise to the top and he starts running the prison. He's in charge. The warden hands off everything. Jo- Joseph is in charge of the prison. And another story happens that gives him some company. And the Talmud tells us that, you know, the story of Joseph, the renegade slave who's trying to seduce his, or allegedly trying to seduce his master's wife, that was front page news. That's all over the tabloids. And immediately after that, in order to drown out the uh, coverage in that story, we find two other high-ranking officials that are being imprisoned in order that the scandal, the first scandal, should get forgotten about. And that's the story of the baker and the cupbearer that they sinned against Pharaoh, and Pharaoh imprisoned them, and they become cellmates, the baker of of Pharaoh and the cupbearer of Pharaoh. And they too have a dream. Each one of them has a dream, and each one's dream actually includes the interpretation of the other guy's dream. So the baker has a dream, but he also has the interpretation of the cupbearer's dream, and the cupbearer has a dream, but also has the interpretation of the baker's dream. And one day, the following day, each one of them, neither of them know their own interpretation. So one of uh, so Joseph appears in the morning and he sees these these two cellmates are they're all saddened and he tries to figure out what's going on with them why you appear so downcast today and they tell him they had a dream but there's no one to interpret the dream so Joseph tells him uh, don't the interpretations of the dream belong to God tell them to me and I'll see if I can try to help you navigate them and understand them so he tells him the dream uh, first the cupbearer tells him the dream. And he tells them that he had a dream, it was a grapevine, and on the grapevine there were three tendrils, the little spinny things that come out of the, of the vine. And it blossomed, and the clusters ripened into grapes, and the Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. He took the grapes, squeezed them into the cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So Joseph is very skillful in his interpretation of the dreams, and he tells them that these three vines represent three days. In three days, you're going to be reinstated. And once again, you're going to present Pharaoh with his wine. The baker hears this and he right away recognizes that Joseph had correctly interpreted. Why? Because he actually got the interpretation of the other guy's dream. 
So he knew it was true because he dreamed that his cellmate is going to be, in three days, go back to Pharaoh and, and, and be reinstated. So he knew it was true. So he said, well, I had also a confounding dream. And on my dream, there were three baskets on my head. And on the top of the basket, there was all these baked goods that I used to make for Pharaoh. And there were birds eating from them. And Joseph tells him, well, your, your dream, I'll tell you what your dream is also. In three days, Pharaoh is going to remove your head from your body and you're going to die. It's really interesting here mm-hmm. to look at the, at just at the, at the dynamics of the story. The, both of them were upset. <coughs> jo- Joseph wakes up in the morning and he sees that both of, his, both, both of his cellmates are disappointed. The butler, the cupbearer, well, he's upset because he sees that his friend is going to be executed. He saw the correct dream, the uh, unscrambled dream of his friends. He knows his friend's going to be executed. He doesn't know what his means. Now, the reason why the baker is upset is he sees the correct interpretation of his friend's dream, i.e. that he's going to be reinstated. So he's envious. So we can actually see that which one of them is just and which one of them is unjust. The butler, the cupbearer, he's just because he's upset because with the downfall of his friend. Whereas the baker, he's unjust because he's upset with the redemption of his friend. So one of them was that was a bad guy. So what, what does it make sense? It made sense that the cupbearer gets reinstated. The other one has his head removed from his body. Jo- the parsha ends where Joseph tells uh, he tells the cupbearer, "Well, just do me a favor, put in a good word for me." Maybe Pharaoh will grant clemency to me like he's going to do for you. In three days, you're going to be back to your perch. You're going to have Pharaoh's ear. Tell him that I've been unjustly imprisoned and if he could please uh, find a way to commute my sentence. And the story goes that indeed three days later was Pharaoh's birthday. He uh, granted clemency to the cupbearer and uh, decapitated the baker and... Or oh, he, he hung him, it was decapitated, but he hung him, he killed him. And yet the cupbearer did not remember Joseph, and he also forgot him. And Rashi, very famous Rashi, tells us that the reason why Joseph had to endure two more years in this in the bowels of this prison is because he relied too much on the cupbearer. What Joseph should have done is relied on God. If you rely on God, when who will take care of you? God will take care of you. You want to rely on man, who will take care of you? Man will take care of you. Well, what happens? You're, you're, you're pinning your hopes on the cupbearer. The cupbearer doesn't remember you. And by the way, he consciously forgot you. He didn't want to have someone as popular and charismatic as Joseph overshadowing everyone else. They, 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 they knew Joseph. They knew he was a great powerhouse. And the second you bring him up in front of Pharaoh and Pharaoh can use a sentence, we'll see how he's going to rise to the top. Well, yeah, he forgot him, yeah, but he kind of also forgot him. Like he also didn't remember. He didn't remember or else he didn't, didn't, didn't make too much of a mental note to, re, to remind him. Yeah, sure, I'll tell Pharaoh about it. Sure, sure, sure. Don't worry about it. I'm going to spend my whole time with Pharaoh trying to intercede on your behalf. Um, but the truth is that Joseph, well, should he not have told it means just being criticized here. What should he? What was the correct thing for him to do? So everyone tries to understand this particular teaching because should Joseph had had not mentioned his plight to the cupbearer? Maybe, maybe Joseph men- should have mentioned it, but not mentally believed that he's going to be his salvation. But I think there's an is an interesting um, takeaway here. What, in, what indeed actually happened was that the salvation was actually brought out because, uh, as a result of the butler, of the, of the cupbearer. Because in two years, the cupbearer is going to finally going to remember about Joseph and going to bring him up in front of Pharaoh. So it's almost Joseph asked for something and he got what he asked for. He asked to be reliant upon the cupbearer for his salvation and the man says, oh, you want him to save you? He will save you. you you'll, go, you'll get what you want, but sometimes you don't realize what we want.
Sometimes we, we, we ask for something, and then when we get it, we're like, I can't believe this is what we asked for. And Joseph, what he should have done, perhaps, was say, no, I'm not going to rely on him. I'll rely on God, and then I'll be happier with the results. Uh, but he chose, he asked God to rely on the cupbearer, and he got what he wanted, but that meant two more years in enslaved, imprisoned, and languishing there. And I think if you look at uh, the, the devolvement of, of Joseph in this parsha, it's, it's really informative. You know, you, you, he starts off the parsha. He's the favorite son of, of Jacob, and he ends up the parsha, and he's just sitting, languishing in prison for what seems like an eternity, and no hopes of salvation. His dreams, his grandiose dreams of being some sort of ruler that's able to lord of his brothers, that is obviously, uh, you know, it's a pipe dream right now, at, at least. He doesn't see, he cannot forecast the way that that's going to happen. But indeed, uh, sometimes the things that are most devastating to us are the ones that are going to most directly contribute to our ascendant in the future, our ascendancy in the future.